Hello, I'm Emma Bruner at Discovery Park of America, and this episode of Real Foot Forward is made possible by Buddy's Wrecker Service in Union City, Tennessee. Request the best and call Buddy's for all your auto needs. Today's guest is Ted Cluck, Assistant Professor of Communication Arts at Union University. I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where every single week we celebrate the history the accomplishments and the people of West Tennessee. I'm so excited to have our guest today, Ted Cluck. Um, are you Dr. Ted Cluck? Um, I'm, I'm not doctor, no. I, uh, I topped out at MFA, Master of Fine Arts. That was enough school for me. So you're Master Ted Cluck. Um, uh, that'll work. You go by Master, okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, so this guy has uh, so many different things he does and has done. Um, he has been, and we're going to talk about all this, he's been a publisher, a wrestler, a football player, a podcaster. He's the assistant professor of communication arts at Union University currently. And so we're going to talk about all those things. But first of all, I want to go all the way back to the beginning. Tell me a little bit about your childhood. Yeah, man. So uh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate you you guys having me on today. So I grew up in a little town in the middle of nowhere in Indiana called Hartford City. We were uh, we were like corn locked, you know, corn all the way around and a uh, very rural uh, little town, um, you know, never really had an inkling for writing, publishing, academia. None of that was even really a glimmer in my eye. I was obsessed with football. Like for me, in our little kind of blue collar, small town context, that was how you got feedback. It was how you were celebrated. It was how you saw your name in the paper. Um, so for me, really from age zero to like 25 um my whole life my all of my energy was channeled there and um you know really had some great times with it went to a small my dad was a pilot so he was a like a a corporate pilot a charter pilot so he flew out of a city called fort wayne which was like 45 minutes north of us um and pops was a football coach too so i i kind of got the the football bug the sports bug from pops uh, my mom was a homemaker, but she was the creative one. You know, she loved reading, loved writing, um, kind of gave me the love for books and creativity at a young age, even though it was all, all football for a while. But, uh, but yeah, it was a really great place and time to grow up, you know, it, just in this 2020 context that we're in with everything so kind of crazy and uncertain. Um, looking back to the mid 90s in rural Indiana, it's, uh, it seems quaint, you know, stuff seemed simpler. And uh, I'm grateful for it. It was a lot of fun. And and were you uh, a kid who did well in English or writing? Did you write any or? No, that- you know what? I was a very, I was an extremely lazy student. I, um, <laughs> I don't think I ever brought a book home. You know, my parents like to joke that like the plastic really never came off the books. And maybe this is the downside of like public small town high school in Indiana in the 90s was that it wasn't real rigorous. But uh, yeah, no, my whole life was just... Um, you know, workouts and, and a little bit of social stuff. And, uh, yeah, I didn't really start caring about school, believe it or not, until I was injured as a college football player. Um, I had broken my leg twice at a big, um, uh, operation and bone graft and the whole deal through one spring, spring football season. I think it was spring ball. My freshman year, I had the big operation and then tried to come back in the fall uh, it didn't work out. And then I was really at a crossroads. You know, I was really in this existential moment of what do I do with the rest of my life? You know, how do I reshape my persona, which is a hard thing for people to do. And uh, as, as it happens, I met a little, a little hottie. I met a girl. Um, she's now my wife of 23 years, but she, uh, she was a great student. She was a writer, a reader. She was a theater girl, which in the nineties, really angsty and hot. And, um, you know, we, we hit it off. She read some of my writing that I did for class and she was like, you know, you ought to, you ought to do something with this. And this is um, at what, at what, uh, what college did you end this up? This is a little school called Taylor university. So Taylor was also in the middle of nowhere in Indiana, um, small Christian college. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was very lucky to meet Kristen there. That, that was a life changer. And I had some professors too, that saw me as more than a football player, you know, and they, and they encouraged me to write, even though I wasn't really listening to it at that point. Um, it, it made a dent and, um, yeah, really, it really changed my life. Did you know what you want? Was there a different direction you were thinking about going, um, when you went into college? 
Yeah. I mean, I just, I thought I would coach, you know, I thought I would coach and play forever. And, and by God's grace, I still get to coach now, which is, is really joyful. I love it. Um, but yeah, I, I really didn't have a plan, you know, and I, th- I think that's not all that different than a lot of college students, you know, nowadays. And I, I don't, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. You know, I think a lot of the, a lot of the game in college is getting there, taking some classes and figuring out what you don't like, figuring out what delights you, um, figuring out what you're good at and not good at, you know, writing always came easy to me and I always loved reading, you know, uh, I always loved a good story. And, uh, once football was over, I, I think being from a small town, I had this real kind of obsession with, I have to make a name for myself. Like I have to prove that I exist, that I'm on the planet, that, somebody cares about me, you know, and once football was over, I thought, you know, writing, publishing, being an author could be that. And it just so happened that the work was really joyful. You know, it was, it was challenging and it's, it's always challenging to make it in a creative field, but the work itself was a joy. I loved putting sentences together. I still do. I love putting a story together and um, that's really never changed. And so what was the uh, first book? Yeah, so the first book was, I think it was 2005, 2006. Um, It was a book called Facing Tyson, 15 Fighters, 15 Stories. So I ended up interviewing 15 guys that fought Mike Tyson throughout the course of Mike's career. And each guy got a chapter, you know, just kind of a long form, deep dive interview. I was young and idealistic. It was my first book. So I decided that I was going to travel all over the country and meet these guys in their own environments. So um, to, to the degree, to the degree that I could help it. I didn't want any phone interviews. I wanted it to be all raw and, and kind of first person. And uh, there it was a blast. Zoom, there wasn't a Zoom back then. so you No, could. thank God. You know, no <laughs> offense. But yeah, there wasn't a Zoom. So yeah, I was getting on airplanes, man, and driving around and really seeing the country in a unique way. Um, you know, for a kid who grew up in a cornfield, it was, it was a pretty amazing way to see the country and see cities, um, to meet a lot of fascinating people. Boxers, are the greatest interviews in sports. You know, they are, they're raw, unfiltered, oftentimes extremely kind, extremely open-hearted. I loved these guys and I loved getting to know their stories. And it was extremely providential how the book came together. I was, I was freelancing for ESPN at the time. I was just kind of getting started with that and um, had gone to visit my in-laws in Orlando, Florida in the summer. You know, so it was like 150 degrees with 98% humidity and I was bored and I saw a guy sweeping his sidewalk in their neighborhood and he looked vaguely familiar. Come to find out he, he had held the heavyweight title for a minute between Muhammad Ali and Mike Tyson. And he had fought Tyson. His name was Pinklin Thomas and Pinklin had a fascinating story in that he was uh, a heroin addict, like starting in middle school and he'd used all on and off throughout his career. And we ended up hanging out that weekend and playing pool and watching fight films. And at the end of it, he asked me if I would write his story. And that's how it, that's how it came about. So, um, it was really the start of, um, something really joyful and a, and a great project. So you had the idea and you had the beginning. What, how did you go about, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, you have now probably heard 10,000 people say, Oh, I'm going to write a book. Yeah. Uh, So how did, you know, what was the process? Did you have some, a publisher already in mind or how did that go? No, I had no idea how any of that worked, you know, and, and for me, everything was self-taught, right? So I think when you're, when you're hungry, right? When you're really driven and you're hungry to get a book published or make a mark or do whatever, like I just did an insane amount of work and research and Googling and I learned how book proposals worked. I learned how to put a book proposal together and I queried publishers and I'm sure did it all wrong the first few times out of the gate, but I found a publisher that you know, love the writing. And I I think for any aspiring writer, like just devotion to the craft, you know, by that time I was, I was reading everybody who I thought was great. I was taking in all this great work so that my work would, would become greater as a result. So really committed to the craft, um, taught myself how to pitch a book and put a sample together. And, um, you know, we were able to do it, which was a lot of fun. And then eventually I got an agent and, you know, they, they do the hard work of negotiating and helping you put proposals together, which I'm the world's worst negotiator. Ask my wife. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that first book was very special. Now, um, 
I'm curious because you've published a lot of books since then. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on self-publishing? And and I've talked to a lot of people about that. Um, I self-published my most recent book versus mm -hmm. having a publisher do it. Um, yeah. And I actually enjoyed that part of it. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know what? I think the, the whole kind of stigma surrounding self-publishing has really changed in the last 10 or 12 years with the advent of print-on-demand technology. You know, it used to be with self-publishing, you would you know, send away thousands of dollars and, and months later you would get boxes of books that would sit in your basement and there was really no way to distribute. And um, it was kind of a vanity thing. In fact, they used to call it vanity publishing. Uh, but now with the advent of print on demand, if, if you're the type of person that has an audience already, let's say because of a podcast or a blog or whatever, um, in some ways you really don't need a publisher, right? Because if you have the talent and the wherewithal to write, edit, design, layout, or you have people in your life who can do that, that stuff for you. Um, you can distribute the book via Amazon and other online platforms. You know, you can really kind of cut out the middleman of a publisher. Now where, where traditional publishing I think has value still is obviously the marketing and distribution pieces are huge, right? So it, it helps to, to still market and distribute that way, but also just the validation of, you know, uh, a publisher vetting your work and finding it worthy. So I, I think there's there's a lot to be said for both ways, to be honest. And um, let's see, almost a decade ago now, I started my own little publishing company with with print on demand. We just wanted to play around with it. You know, we wanted to see does this work. If I have a good idea that's kind of evergreen, would the book continue to sell? And it's been a fun little experiment through the industry to try to figure out if we can make that model work. Um, and then, you know, with the, with all the changes going on in the publishing industry, the bookstores that are closing and probably the ones that unfortunately will, will not come back now. Um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of, uh, independent bookstores around that I found were more, uh, eager to have an author come and do yeah. a talk and sell books. And, um, you know, with Amazon, it's set, set up so easily that anybody who's mm -hmm. listening, who's interested in publishing a book, I always just say, go for it. You know, yeah. you have to do a lot of Googling. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, my, I mean, I Googled, um, how do you publish a book? Yeah, that absolutely. Was, that got yep. me started. So, and so the, other, the, other, the other nice part about it is that the publishers keep quite a, two things bugged me. They yeah. keep a lot of the money. From oh my the goodness. Mail. Yes, absolutely. They do. And then you have no say so over the title or mm -hmm. the cover. That's you know, right. They'll listen to you, but they're the ones who who do whatever they're going to do, and so that was yeah. kind of strange to me. Creative control is a great thing, right? So it's if if you're self publishing, it is great to be able to name the book what you want it, design it the way you want it, um, and that's kind of the trade off that you make, right? You lose marketing and distro, but you get that creative control back, which is a an important thing in some cases. Can I ask what your book's about? Uh, yeah. So uh, the most recent one is about Odd McIntyre. Um, okay. He was, a, um, he was a journalist back in the teens and the 20s um, mm -hmm. in New York. Okay. Uh, and he was, he also, um, while he was hugely successful at the time and place, mm -hmm. he suffered mightily from obsessive compulsive disorder. And so he wow. hit that from everybody. So fascinating. Um, it's a history. It's, it's all about the history of that and, and that time and place. And oh, he I wrote love about it. celebrities and, you know, mm -hmm. hung out with Valentino and, mm. you know, anyway. So it, to me, writing, writing is a lot like reading from the inside out. Yeah. You, know, you just get so into it. So tell me yeah. a little bit more about um, what you've written since then. What or what 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 do you what is your uh, what is your type of book that you write now? Yeah, so my type used to be creative nonfiction. You know, so memoir, long interviews. So since facing Tyson, I did a couple of other football books. You know, kind of mass market football type books. Um, I did a memoir about a season that I spent playing arena football back in the mid two thousands in Michigan. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, wrote some books in the kind of Christian theology, Christian living space, um, which did pretty well. I did a memoir about my my son's adoptions from Ukraine called "Hello, I Love You: Adventures in Adoptive Fatherhood." That one was real near and dear to my heart. So for a long time, it was creative nonfiction, the memoir, the long interview, the kind of deep dive into a topic. Uh, I wrote a book about the 1987 NFL players strike, which was a, a weird little moment in pro football history that I found fascinating. 
Um, but lately it's been graphic novels for like middle school aged kids. Um, I got a publisher and man for the life of me, I don't even remember how this came about. They may have approached me. They wanted to open up sort of a, a, a younger person's publishing wing and they were getting into this idea of graphic novels and they asked if I would be interested in writing one. And I said, yes, but I said that I would do it with the caveat that there would be no sort of high concept, right? So no magical powers, no created fanciful world. Like I'm an earth guy, you know, for better, or for worse. I just want to write a story about a kid who goes to school and has, you know, kind of the usual things going on. So I uh, wrote the book, had a blast. Um, it was fun. It was funny. They paired me with a, um, an illustrator who I've never met, but who did amazing work. And we've got two of those now. And uh, I, I tell my wife, I would, if that was the last kind of book that I ever got to write, I, I would be happy writing those. Those are a lot of fun. And your, uh, your name is perfect for that. Um, for yeah. That genre. Yeah. You grew up with the last name Cluck in a public school in the nineties. <laughs> you got to be tough, right? It's not right. quite like a boy named Sue, but it's, it's close, you know? Yeah. Um, and are they uh, Christian themed books? They are. Yeah. Yeah. The, the publisher is called Harvest House. They're a, a Christian publisher. So the books are, um, I think, relatable for anybody, but they have, you know, they have a little bit of Christian content and gospel content, too, which um, is fun. You know, as a, as a believer myself, it's, um, it's been freeing to be able to write in that space and um, include scripture and, and gospel content in my books. And so um, we're going to back up a little bit more. At some point, you like writing and like education so much that uh, you continue and that becomes a career for you. So yeah, uh, how, how did that come about? You know, it's interesting. It's, it's a tough racket making your living as a writer, as you know. Um, so we did it for a while, uh, but it was kind of feast or famine. It was up and down. You know, we were, we were kind of living on a prayer as, as Bon Jovi would say. And uh, <laughs> I started looking for some alternate revenue streams and just other things I could do. So um, I actually started adjuncting this was before I even had a, an advanced degree of any kind, but I started teaching like freshman comp at a community college in Michigan where the majority of our students were um, like recently released from prison or they had just gotten back from um, military deployments. So it was, a, it was a tough crowd, but I absolutely loved it. You know, I, I loved the performance aspect of it. I loved being with, the, with these folks, teaching them how to write, teaching them how to take something that was up here or in here. Um, and get it out. And I was like, man, this is amazing. But I didn't have the advanced degree. I didn't especially want to go back to grad school, you know, because in my mind, school was still just a boring hurdle, you know. But uh, finally, after lots of cajoling, uh, I went to graduate school. I got this Master of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction and absolutely loved it. Loved the process. It was like writing camp, you know. Um, it was just a blast. I think my writing got better. I was already like, 10, 10 books deep in, into my career when I went to grad school. Um, but I got the credentials so that I could eventually end up with a job like the one that I have now. You know, I realized that um, as my kids were getting older, I wanted the stability of an academic job um, where I could teach people how to write, you know, and I could, I could help people pursue their dreams in publishing. And um, it's joyful work, man. I tell you, it's, uh, it's a job like any other job, you know, so you have the the peaks and valleys, the thorns and thistles, as it were. But, um, but I really love the work. I love the relationships. I love the classroom. It's a joyful thing to be able to do. What, what's it like uh, pursuing that line of work in, you're not in quite as rural a community as we are here, but it's still, you know, it's not New York or Chicago. Um, yeah. what, are the, what are the positives or the negatives of that? Yeah, I mean, early on in the ESPN years when I was freelancing, and later when I got into screenwriting and screenplays, I mean, there were, there were the, should we move to LA or New York kind of conversations. And I think if, if it had just been my wife and I, we would have done it because we, we love big cities and, you know, we've, we've been fortunate to be able to live a lot of places before we had kids and, and we kind of enjoyed the adventure of that. And it would have opened up different avenues for me as a writer. But by the time the kids came, you know, I really liked, I liked the slower pace of life in the Midwest and um, I didn't necessarily want to go to New York and live in like 500 square feet with two kids and barely make it and, and do that whole thing. And uh, so it was just a 
kind of a quality of life decision. And for me, like after I'd done some books and had that validation and, and gotten published in some magazines and done all that, like there, there was less of a gnawing kind of ache to prove myself. I didn't feel like I had to go to New York and, and show people that I could do it. And a lot of that was probably just maturity, you know, growth and maturity in the Lord and, you know, kind of being more okay with who I was and where he had put me. And um, similarly with academia, I don't put a lot of value in the, the kind of like curb appeal of a university. And um, how I got to Union is, is strange in that I, I, they flew me down for a speaking engagement after one of the books came out. And I ended up keeping in touch with a guy at Union for a few years after, and uh, he let me know about the job, and I ended up down here, you know. And um, I, I know a lot of people in the academy who play the, like, le level up game. You know, can I get to a school that's just a little more impressive and then a little more impressive after that? But um, for me, it's about fit. It's about, you know, living in a place that we love, going to a church that we love, having friends at work that I love working with. You know, I'm, I'm blessed in those regards. So I would be. I think it would be foolish for me to like be casting about anymore looking for a different fit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, quality of life. That's what I always, you know, talk about is there is an insane quality of life here where you can, instead of being uh, in a traffic jam for an extra 45 minutes, you can be on your bike. That's uh, right. Morning I was riding my bike and I was, you know, really noticing the crops are all starting to come up right yeah. now. Yeah. So it really, you know, it was six o'clock in the morning, it was sunrise and, you know, yeah. I was thinking, hey, this, this is what living in a rural community is all about. Oh, most definitely. Like, this is a beautiful place for cycling, by the way. Um, you're, are you a road or mountain bike guy? Uh, I actually have both. Okay. Um, but around here, I've been riding my mountain bike on the road. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Cool. The so roads cool. are narrow around here, man. It's, so it's, it's treacherous cycling, but it's really pretty and... Um, you're right. You know, there, there's a lot to be said for that way of life. And, you know, it's funny when we moved down here and you probably experienced this moving from DC, people were almost apologetic. I mean, they were excited that we were here and it was like, Hey, welcome to Jackson. And then they started apologizing and it's like, no, we love it here. This is really great. You know, um, you don't have to apologize for it. We chose it and, and we're so glad. Right. People are kind of skeptical. Like they're thinking, oh, no, they're going to get here and they're not going to, um, you know. Well, yeah, they I think you're going to leave, too. Like yeah. for the first two and a half, three years, they were just like, are you guys looking for jobs elsewhere? When are you going to leave? And it's like, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, you know, Lord willing, I'm going to be here for a long time. Yeah. But you are right about talk a little bit about your bike riding, because I know you've uh, you ride a uh, vintage bike. Tell us about that. Yeah, man. So growing up. I was always in conflict between cycling and football and football is a big guy sport. So you got to put on, you know, size and bulk to be good at football. But I always loved cycling and just the freedom of being on the bike and the, all the cliche things like the wind in your face and cycling was something that I really enjoyed with my dad. You know, we would go out on these long rides and, and um, do these big group rides and the whole, the whole deal. But uh, I got a chance a few years ago to play football in France so I spent some time playing and coaching in France. And of course, France is, you know, kind of the epicenter of cycling culture. And uh, I got into these vintage French road bikes over there. So uh, when I got back, I bought one of these old bikes. And uh, I just like the aesthetics of it. I like the old ones. I like the steel frames. Um, you know, to me, cycling is one of those. And football is this way for me, too. The aesthetics of the sport matter. And um, I like the beauty and the functionality of a bike and a frame. And um, I don't know, it's just fun for me. It's not a cheap sport. It's uh, not. It's <laughs> not, unfortunately. But, you know, honestly, when you're as big as I am, like I'm pushing 260. So if I, if I, if I like have a frame that's a little bit heavier, it really, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. So I'm not, I'm not paying extra for like the space age carbon fiber type, type stuff, you know. But do you have, do they have bike trails in Jackson that you can ride on or do you ride on the roads? I ride on the road. Yeah, I ride on the road for better or for worse. My biggest challenge is remembering that there could be cars on there. Because oh, for sure, ride. yeah. Sometimes I'll ride my whole 20 mile route mm -hmm. and never have another car or truck or any other vehicle. Oh, that's amazing. You know, that's amazing. I have a specific place that I know can I, I can avoid yep. dogs. Yeah. Uh, but then every once in a while, a car will come, I'll be listening. Yeah. You know, a car will come up and I'll be like, Oh, remember there mm -hmm. are cars here. So absolutely. Absolutely. So what's, so what's next for you? What, what are you uh, working on now? What projects you have coming up? 
Man, so a few years ago, this is before we moved down from Michigan, um, there was a venue that I loved there in, in Detroit called the Pontiac Silverdome. And that was home to the Detroit Lions for many, many years. The Detroit Pistons played there. WrestleMania three was there. The Pope, Elvis. I mean, they had all these iconic um, events at the Pontiac Silverdome. And it was one of these quintessentially like 70s and 80s domed stadiums with like the inflatable roof. And the interesting thing that happened to the Silverdome was that the Lions moved out of it in like 2001. And then it just sat there. Um, it sat for like a decade and a half as the city was too bankrupt to knock it down and the earth kind of took it over and a private investor bought it at one point. And it was just this weird sort of um, hot, hot mess there in Detroit that we, that we all kind of kept our eye on. And one summer I decided I wanted to write a story about a guy who played there. So a fictional like pro quarterback who had played there but had an existential crisis and ended up leaving his family and going back to his old stadium to live as a squatter. Um, so I wrote this thing. I originally wrote it as a short film, but then I was like, nah, there's no market for short films. Um, so I blew it out. I expanded it into a feature and uh, called Silverdome and started showing it to some people. I almost sold it to a guy in Hollywood named Timothy Busfield, who was in a show called The West Wing. He was in uh, Field of Dreams. Sure. But everybody I showed it to in Hollywood wanted to make it sort of concussion-y. You know, they wanted to attach kind of the lurid social issue to it. And I just wanted a quiet story between a husband and a wife, a reconciliation type story. So, um, and I really, I wanted to shoot in the Silverdome. I thought it would be a, an amazing backdrop for an independent film. So, ended up showing it to a couple of friends of mine who had played in the NFL, just kind of on a lark, one of whom was unspeakably handsome and starting an acting career. And uh, he read it. His name's Glenn Pakulak. He punted at uh, Kentucky. was an all SEC punter and then punted in the league. And Glenn, he read the script, fell in love with it. He said, you know, you, you told my story and this is the story of so many guys who played. And um, he's like, I want to make this. So he got some people together, some ex NFL players and coaches, some investors. So long story short, uh, we got 10 days in the Pontiac Silverdome to shoot the movie. And uh, we shot the whole thing in 10 days. Wow. Um, and now, yeah, we're in, we're in post-production now. It's been a long process. You know, it's a long, arduous process. And back to our whole discussion about creative control versus like big, big studio, big company. Um, it's such a near and dear story to me that we wanted to do it ourselves and we wanted to have full control over it. So what we've got now is a really unique football picture that was made by football people, you know? Um, and I've seen the rough cut. I loved it. I was afraid to watch it, you know, because I was, I was like, what if it sucks? <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't even let my wife watch it with me the first time. I was like, I've, I've got to go to the office by myself and do this. So I uh, saw the rough cut. I loved it. I think the story really works. So yeah, the project now is finishing up Silverdome, getting it distributed and hopefully bringing a beautiful feature film you know, into people's homes via some streaming platform. Wow, that is so exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's fun, man. It was so a fun what, process. What, what inspires you to jump in these big projects that, you know, a lot of people say, well, I want to make a movie. Yeah. But, you know, they don't. And so yeah. what, what do you think, what, what, what is the secret? Oh, man, that's a great question. I think curiosity. Um, you know, we're getting a little echo now. But, uh, but yeah, curiosity, wanting to learn a new craft you know, just wanting to be great at something different, something new, the desire to keep pushing yourself. I, I think, you know, all those years in football were not wasted because football taught me how to suffer. You know, it taught me how to, to hurt and be hurting and get knocked down and keep going. So I think there's a, within any athlete, and you know this as a cyclist, like there's a, there's a deep desire to just keep going and to see how far you can go and how far you can take something. And when this movie started, it was you know, first it was just, I want to write it. I want to learn the formatting. I want to write a good script, but then it became, well, I wonder if anybody would make this, you know? And when these football guys started reading it and really connecting with the story, that's when I thought we could have something. Um, and, and yeah, so as, again, as you get older, as you mature, there were years when I probably used to dream about like, what, what kind of a tux am I going to wear to the Oscars? But, um, I don't, I don't have a lot of those vain kind of dreams anymore. It's really just about doing a good job. You know, I want to do a good movie and I want to have something good that I've made. 
in the same way that if you make furniture, that's what you want. Or if you grow vegetables in your garden, that's what you want. Um, I just want to do a good job. And so what's the timeline for when, when will we see it? Yeah, great question. So post-production now is involving scoring the movie, soundtracking the movie, you know, getting all the little like audio quirks worked out. When you shoot for 10 days in a place that has no electricity, no running water, you know, it was really like, there's just this bombed out place. So um, the audio is a little like, you know, wonky from scene to scene, but um, yeah, we're getting all that stuff ironed out. We're getting like all the B roll and transitional stuff kind of folded into the narrative. And, you know, it's June now. I, I would hope that by the end of calendar 2020, we have a movie to distribute. Um, well, I'll be watching for it. Where, where's the best place for people who are interested to find out more about your projects, what you've got going on, what you're writing? Yeah. So I'm a little bit of an old man in the sense that I don't do social media. You don't do um, social media. So how do we find out? Yeah. So I have a podcast called The Happy Rant. Um, the Happy Rant has social media. So we have a Happy Rant Facebook and Twitter. Um, I have a friend who very graciously maintains like a Facebook author page for me. So um, you can follow Ted Cluck on Facebook, even though I'm, I'm not on there. I don't even know how to log into it. So Zach does that for me. And, uh, and I have a website, tedcluck.com. So T -E and I've been listening to your, I've been listening to your podcast while I've been riding my bike. So it's oh, really, appreciate it, man. Yeah. It's really oh, thank fun. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we have I, a lot of fun like I, I felt like I already knew you when we started talking. Uh, yeah. Right on, right on. Well, I appreciate you listening. And that, that was one of those things that, um, because I didn't do social media, but the industry, the publishing industry wants to see a platform and they want to see you promoting. And, you know, I kept saying no to like Twitter and Facebook and all this stuff, but five or six years ago when, when the podcast came calling, that seemed like an easy thing to say yes to. And I'm glad I did because I love doing it. Yeah, it's, it's very fun. Uh, well, thank you so much for being on our podcast today. Oh man, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.